Good evening, everybody. Um, we're almost on time, so this is, this is really terrific. My name is uh, Carton Rogers. I'm the Vice Provost and Director of Libraries here at Penn, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 Beitler Collection Distinguished Lecture. We are truly honored to have Trudy Rubin, the extraordinary international political columnist from the Philadelphia Inquirer, giving this year's lecture. And her topic, the relevance of Dreyfus in the age of ISIS, is one that should resonate with us all. Before moving to um, tonight's lecture, I'd like to just say a, a word about the collection, the donor, and the supportive group behind this lecture series. Great research libraries like Penn's are made up of many important and distinct collections of material. Some collections are focused on specific authors and their periods. Think of our very rich Furness Shakespeare collection or the Turing collection of material by and about Jonathan Swift. Some are collections that, are folk, that represent broad swaths of human history. The Lee Collection, uh, which uh, takes a long look at the history of the Catholic Church and the Inquisition, or the Caroline F. Schimmel Collection of Women in the American Wilderness, which captures in women's words their story of the settling of the American West. And then there are collections that are even more tightly focused on a specific event, on its historical significance, and the enduring lessons that it can teach us. The Lorraine Beitler collection of the Dreyfus Affair is one of the latter, and we are very fortunate indeed that Lorraine entrusted her great collection to our care. This is a serious scholarly resource, which she single-handedly and with great determination, and any, any of you here who know Lorraine knows that she has great determination, um, built into a truly amazing archive. Beyond building the collection to memorialize the affair, it has been Lorraine's constant vision to use this material to teach generations after generations of people about the evils of anti-Semitism and of prejudice writ large. And her collection continues to amaze and to teach. Just, just last year, the Penn Libraries hosted an exhibition of Dreyfus materials curated by Professor Andre Dombrowski, along with a number of his students. It's called The Image Affair, uh, Dreyfus in the Media, 1894 to 1906. And it's an extraordinary catalog. It was an extraordinary exhibition, and I hope some of you at least had an opportunity to see it. And it's an exhibition that's even more amazing in a sense because all of the material in it came from the Lorraine Beitler collection. I would have loved to have introduced Lorraine to you tonight had you recognized her for her vision and her tenacity, but unfortunately uh, her husband Marty is quite ill and she is with him uh, as we speak. But uh, I think those of us uh, who know Lorraine well know that she's also with us uh, tonight in spirit. Let me quickly thank a number of people for tonight's event and for their support of the Beitler Collection. The Beitler Advisory Committee, many of, the, many of whom are in attendance tonight, um, have been extremely supportive uh, in terms of uh, their time and their, uh, uh, their intellectual resources in helping us think about how to best leverage the, the uh, collection. Um, I specifically want to note the events subcommittee of the, uh, the group, Marge Dugan and Jermaine Ingram, for having the uh, vision to uh, pick tonight's speaker. Uh, we're extremely fortunate for their uh, work in this regard. I'd like to thank um, the Penn Library's events coordinator, coordinator uh, Alita Arthurs, who put together uh, the reception that will follow this event. Andrea Gottschalk for maintaining the, uh, the Beitler Collection website, the Library Advancement Office for marketing and promoting of the event. And I, by the looks of it, they did a really terrific job. So that's, that's fantastic. We're very excited to have this many people here with us tonight. 
Uh, David McKnight, my good uh, colleague, who's the director of the Rare Books and Manuscript Library here in the Kislak Center, for shepherding this process and for managing all things um, Beitler for the Penn Libraries. And again, uh, Lorraine Beitler in absentia many times over for uh, entrusting this extraordinary collection uh, with the Penn Libraries. Let me quickly introduce my uh, wonderful colleague, Lance Donald Evanson, Evans, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Lance is Professor Emeritus of Romance Languages, and his expertise is in 16th and early 17th century French literature. His interests include the major authors of the 16th century and the devotional poets of the early 17th century. He has published many books and journal articles, too many to enumerate here, and his current research focuses on the relationship between fine arts and literature, travel writing during the Renaissance, and the thematics and semiology of costume in French Renaissance literary text. Um, Lance is a great friend to the Penn Libraries and a tireless supporter of the Dreyfus Collection. He also, he also wrote a, a wonderful book that actually I can read because it's not in French, and, um, but it's 100 great French books from the Middle Ages to the present. And um, my bucket list includes reading all of Dickens, rereading all of P.G. Woodhouse, and the 100 great French books, thanks to uh, my good friend, Lance Donaldson Evans. Lance? Thank you, Cotton. Had I known, I would have brought uh, the 50 or 60 books I still have in my basement for a book signing. But <laughs> That's not what we're here for tonight. So as chair of the advisory committee of the Lorraine Beitler Dreyfus Affair Collection, I have the great pleasure of welcoming you all to this year's distinguished lecture. As you know, thanks to Lorraine's generosity and to her passion for collecting, and I've coined a word, Dreyfusiana, anything to do with Dreyfus, Penn now has one of the finest collections of material devoted to L'Affaire Dreyfus, had to get some French in there somewhere, in the United States, if not the world. Part of the mission of her collection is to remind us of the relevance of L'Affaire Dreyfus to our current political and social situation. To do this, Lorraine has endowed a distinguished lecture series of which today's event, or this evening's event, is the latest. Now, as you may remember, journalism, and in particular, Émile Zola's famous letter, J'accuse, which appeared in the newspaper L'Aurore, played a vital role in overturning Alfred Dreyfus's scandalously false conviction for espionage in late 19th and early 20th century France. And it is for this reason that we invited this year's speaker from among the Philadelphia journalism community, and we approached the journalists that we consider to be the most distinguished, the most astute, and the most influential commentator on international affairs, Trudy Rubin. As you can see, she was gracious enough to accept our invitation, and we're delighted to have her with us tonight. Now, if you're like me, when Thursday's and Sunday's Inquirer arrive, the first thing you turn to after maybe looking at the headlines, or maybe not, <laughs> uh, is to turn to her column, which constantly educates, challenges, and inspires. And it appears not only in the Inquirer, but in many newspapers across the country. As you know, Trudy Rubin is the foreign affairs columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer and is a member of the Inquirer's editorial board. She has special expertise on the Middle East, Russia, South Asia, and is a frequent guest on NPR and PBS news shows. She's just recently returned from a fact-finding visit to Iraq, which must have been fun. <laughs> She's the author of the book, Willful Blindness, The Bush Administration and Iraq. Her distinguished career before coming to the Inquirer in 1983 includes working as a correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor and as staff writer for The Economist of London. She was a radio correspondent in Prague during the Prague Spring of 1968 a Jefferson Fellow at the East-West Center in Honolulu, 
an exchange journalist in the Mos- for, to the Moscow News, a fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard, and an Alicia Patterson Foundation fellow in Cairo and Beirut. In 2008, she was awarded the Edward Weintel Prize for Diplomatic Reporting, and in 2010, she won the Arthur Ross Award from the Academy of American Diplomacy for Distinguished Reporting and Analysis on Foreign Affairs. I should also mention that she earned a BA from Smith College and an MSc in Economics from the London School of Economics. We welcome you most warmly and are greatly looking forward to hearing you talk about the relevance of Dreyfus in the age of ISIS. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, And thank you all for coming out. I looked at the rainy weather this morning and I thought, oh, nobody, but the sun came out and here you all are. Maybe you even would have been here if it was raining, so thank you very much. I have to figure out how to use this uh, podium here and actually see. Uh, Two weeks ago, I ended a trip to the north of Iraq and to Syria, uh, went across the Tigris in a motorboat um, from one side to the other, a trip that was uh, taken to investigate progress in the war against ISIS. And when I left Syria and Iraq, I went to Brussels and then to Paris uh, thinking, that I was just going to relax and attend a conference and perhaps uh, do a little good eating in Paris. In Brussels, as it turned out, um, I visited the Muslim district of Molenbeek, uh, from which most of the terrorists came who launched the horrendous November attack last year, because as soon as I reached Brussels, they had just caught the last surviving member of the terrorist group that did the Paris attacks. And as it turned out, I left Brussels just a day before the bombs went off at the airport and on the metro. Uh, Excuse me one minute, could someone get me some water? I'd be very grateful, thank you. When I reached Paris, my first stop was to pay my respects outside the lovely Bataclan Concert Hall with its Chinese-style painted exterior. It was very sobering to walk along the side and look at the windows where people were trying to jump out and were stopped by terrorists who were firing at them and throwing grenades, and 90 music lovers, mostly young people, died there. Then I stopped at the nearby Place de République, which was still filled with tributes to the victims. Thanks so much. Including those mowed down at several cafes nearby and at a soccer stadium outside the stadium. Fortunately, they didn't get in. The very next day, terrorists struck again at the Brussels airport and metro and the Eiffel Tower lit up in sympathy with the colors of the Belgian flag. What I saw on this trip provides a leitmotif to today's lecture, the relevance of Dreyfus in the age of ISIS. The drama and the tragedy of the Dreyfus affair took place in a very different era than ours, but two central themes link them in my mind at least. First, how do you preserve tolerance and avoid scapegoating during a time of great change that provokes public fears and anxiety and inspires extremism? And second, more personal, what role does the media play in providing a reality check for the public Or alternatively, what role does it play in exacerbating those fears? Obviously, the time in which Dreyfus lived was very different from today. 
in, 19, I'm sorry, in 1894, when he was wrongfully convicted, France was still suffering from the trauma of the 1870 defeat at the hands of the Prussians and Bismarck. The French army, smarting over its humiliating loss of Alsace, was eager to restore the aura of French national greatness. It had never fully accepted the Third Republic, which had been beset with crises and scandals. So you had a lost war, a rocky government, an uncertain republic, an anxious military that felt its role was threatened and its reputation. You had a public that felt France's greatness had been besmirched and wanted someone to blame and was susceptible to the calls of a nationalist populism. Meantime, anti-Semitism was on the rise in Paris uh, and elsewhere in Europe. In eras of turmoil, a scapegoat is always necessary. Then suddenly there was another scandal with a military trader at a high level selling secrets, easiest to focus on the Jew, who had risen through meritocracy, not via the nobility or traditional army circles. The reason that the Dreyfus scandal became such a watershed long after the military realized he was innocent, but kept producing new forged documents to keep him in prison, was because if Dreyfus was shown to be the victim of military injustice, the army would be in the dock, and its status might take another blow. Dreyfus had become the symbol of the shifting social and political currents in France, not simply the struggle of left versus right, but of republicanism and secularism on the one hand versus clericalism, monarchism, and military forces who might carry out a coup. This struggle galvanized attention throughout Europe. Dreyfus was also a victim of vicious media wars of the time in which anti-Semitic newspapers and broadsheets leveled the most odious smears against him, but other papers, such as L'Aurore, bravely let Emile Zola publicly jacuse on the front page, despite immense pressure against him and the newspaper. I will get back to the role of the media at such times, but let me talk first about the initial link between the Dreyfus era and ours. The question of how you preserve tolerance during a time of great change that provokes public anxiety and inspires political extremes. I don't need to tell you that we are living at a time of extraordinary global change. In the West, the technology, financial manipulations, and open borders that were initially touted as the key to a new prosperity have instead widened economic inequality and squeezed the middle class. Uh, it, it's almost impossible now, it seems like decades ago, to remember the triumphalism that was popular in the early 90s, the end of history, Fukuyama. It seems so long ago. Equally unsettling, the US dominated international order that prevailed since World War II is unraveling with new speed. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, a post-Cold War interregnum lulled many into believing that liberal democracy had triumphed as the global model of choice. Europeans assumed that further integration guaranteed future prosperity and peace. Those illusions have faded. There's no time to go into great detail, although I can if people have questions, but most of you are probably well aware of the causes of the great fade. Suffice it to mention, and I can tell you that I have seen this over and over again abroad, the mess that the United States made with the Iraq War and the 2008 financial crisis undermined the widespread global belief in the competency of America's democratic model. 
Um, it is really discouraging to hear the sneers with which uh, I, I hear American democracy discussed from Russia to the Middle East to Europe, in large part because people really did believe that whatever sins the United States might commit in terms of mismanaged or wrongly started wars, they knew what they were doing. Uh, now that belief in American competency has also faded. Um, in the meantime, uh, European, Europe's financial crises have undermined faith in their union. And let me not fail to mention uh, that our presidential election is raising a lot more questions, not just about America's competency, but about sanity abroad. <laughs> so again, the models that people admired and aspired to because they thought they worked have lost their luster. Um, meantime, right-wing parties are on the rise throughout Europe, including the National Front in France, and they are being aided financially and in other ways by Vladimir Putin, who hopes to accelerate the splintering of the European Union and NATO. He also hopes his model of managed democracy, uh, you know, which means authoritarianism with window dressing, will gain global traction with him as its leader. I think there isn't enough coverage given to the ways in which the Russians cleverly are trying to undermine democratic norms in Europe. Uh, just talk to the Balts. I mean, for example, the, uh, the Russians are actually aiding European groups, uh, sorry, environmental groups uh, that are opposed to fracking or the import of US LNG because they don't want the Balts to be less dependent on Gazprom, uh, <laughs> the Russian gas giant. Uh, the Russians are also feeding money underground and sometimes openly, in the case of the National Front in France, openly, to right-wing political parties. Uh, and in many other ways are cleverly, uh, sometimes with our unwitting help, with Europe's unwitting help, uh, trying to support the right and encourage those forces which want to withdraw from the European Union, whether it's a Brexit with the, with the Brits, perhaps after a referendum deciding to withdraw, or whether it's simply helping parties whose platform calls for withdrawal from the EU. Um, Meantime, the role of the scapegoat, belabored by US and European populists as the main cause of society's angst, has been neatly filled in this instance, not by Jews, but by Muslims and refugees. Let me add here that I happen to believe, uh, from what I've observed in Syria, uh, not just uh, watching but from afar, but being there, that some of Putin's recent bombings of civilians in the Aleppo area were intended to create a greater refugee flow into Europe, because the refugee flow is now undermining the woman who has become his bete noire, who was once his friend, Angela Merkel. So Putin is contributing to the image of the scapegoat, the scapegoat of Muslims and refugees. Of course, in Europe, and to a lesser extent in America, this fear is stoked by an understandable nervousness about potential terrorist attacks and by the reality of Islamist jihadis. Uh, frankly, although it is important not to demonize all Muslims, I believe it does little good to avoid mentioning the religious basis of Islamic or Islamist jihadism. Um, I think sometimes President Obama is much too careful in this regard and what it does is make people feel that somehow uh, their leadership 
is secretly, at least amongst conspiracy theories, this argument is pushed, secretly abetting the terrorists. One has to deal frankly with the fact that there is a current of radical Islam that is supporting terrorism and look at how that current can be opposed with the help of Muslims, the great majority, who do not support it. So it doesn't help to ignore the reality of the word Islamist when it comes to jihadis. And you see that people, Muslims who are affected by this, talk openly about the danger of radical Islam. When I visited the Molenbeek neighborhood of Brussels, shortly before the airport bombing, as I mentioned, Muslim residents there told me about their frustration in dealing with the changes that had overtaken their community over the past decade, which included the emergence of radical bookstores, uh, bookstores, Islamic bookstores selling radical tracts, the arrival of hardline imams, and jihadi recruiters who enticed high school dropouts to make jihad in Syria. I will tell you that when I went into Syria in December 2012, crossing the Turkish border, and went to the headquarters of one of the Islamist groups there, um, one of the radical Islamist groups there, not Al-Qaeda, and it was before ISIS, but a group that is only one step removed, the first person I met was a Belgian. Uh, he had red hair. Uh, his father was a Syrian. His mother was a Belgian. He went to the University of Louvain, spoke fluent French, had a Belgian passport. Um, somebody like that could well be coming back to Molenbeek and recruiting youths to follow him back across the Turkish border to Syria. Residents of Molenbeek also told me about their struggles to try to fight back with very little help from the Brussels greater municipality, from their local Molenbeek municipality, or from the Belgian government. They spoke of crumbling under-resourced schools, which did little to prevent kids from dropping out at ages 12 to 13. I met one local who told me he was the head of the parents' association at an elementary school, which I saw looks like a fortress, directly across the street from the hideout of where the only survivor of the Paris bombers was captured on March 18th. The man told me that teachers often never showed up at his children's schools, that the kids lacked textbooks, and that required subjects necessary to matriculate and go on to middle school were often not taught at all in the school. Yet Brussels city officials told me there were no local funds available to improve the schools. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, but in this case, uh, the consequences can be even more dangerous to society. It was clear to me that in Europe's Muslim neighborhoods, there are struggling residents desperate to work for better lives if a way is found to reach them. Contrary to the image that many people have here about no-go zones, um, and which I think many people in Europe have who never go near these areas, there are many people who have assimilated, who have businesses, and there are people with one foot in the assimilated community and one foot in the local community who want to try to help their community in its struggles, but they can't get the help they need. So rather than no-go areas, as conspiracy theories, theorists label them, and some presidential candidates here follow suit, these are areas where resources should be invested and might do some good. Similarly, um, and I use the word similarly here in terms of negatives, proposals like those of Senator Ted Cruz to patrol and secure 
Muslim neighborhoods in America scapegoat an entire category of Americans, Muslim Americans, who, by the way, mostly live in integrated neighborhoods. Yet in a climate where the less educated and even many of the more educated have been made fearful by terrorist attacks, the demonization of Muslims or refugees is the perfect weapon for populists. For one thing, terrorism works, even though only small numbers are killed. It terrorizes. In Paris, when I wanted to pay my respects to the new site where Charlie Hebdo magazine is located, after its staff were slaughtered by jihadis in 2014, a journalist friend told me this would be impossible. The magazine now operates out of a secret headquarters with no outside sign of its operation. And when I walked by the synagogue near where I was staying with friends in the Marais, I had to pass armed soldiers who stand guard outside and have been doing so for years now. So no wonder ordinary Parisians, whether or not they admit it, might be fearful of French Muslims. Most of the terrorist attacks have been carried out by people who have citizenship in the countries in which they are living. And no wonder Parisians might be anxious to prevent a new influx of Muslim immigrants. No wonder the immigration issue has fueled the advance of national party leader Martine Le Pen. Uh, yes, she has expelled her father who founded the party out of the party's ranks. He just called the, the Nazi gas chambers a detail of World War II. But the party still wants to end NATO cozy up to Putin, and withdraw from the EU. And no wonder Germany's right wing is feeding off the highly moral stance of Angela Merkel, Merkel, who decided to welcome hundreds of thousands of new immigrants, many from Syria. The manipulation of this issue is all too easy. Nobody wants to talk about the hard stuff that has to be done. Uh, solving the ISIS question and the Syrian civil war, which is sending uh, at least half of the refugees fleeing towards Europe, is really difficult. And dealing logically with the influx of migrants is terribly hard, it takes a lot of money. The numbers, while huge, are not insurmountable. Um, both Germany and France have learned a lot of lessons about what should be done and shouldn't be done in terms of integration. They are not starting from scratch. It is not as if Germany is back in the 1960s when they didn't understand the consequences of waves of Turkish guest workers coming in who brought their wives from Anatolia, who didn't speak any German and never learned German, so the kids were ill-prepared when they went to, to school. Those lessons have been incorporated in society. And in truth, many of the Syrian immigrants who are coming now, half of the group that are coming, are educated. Syria had a reasonably good school system before the Civil War, and most kids were literate and went uh, at least through middle school. So there is material to work with. If you saw the immigrant interviews, that there were so many of them on television for a while, most of these families were saying they wanted their children immediately to learn German. But few Germans or Frenchmen or women will have the opportunity that I have had to visit Iraq and Syria and talk with some of the people who are making this dangerous voyage. I mean, for example, Yazidis. Many of the people who are going on this dangerous immigrant run are Yazidis. Uh, the people who have been raped and slaughtered by ISIS, who most of you probably have heard about, uh, 2,000 women still in sexual slavery with their families desperate to try to buy them out, which is one reason why a lot of young Yazidis are making this trip. 
A few will have talked with Kurds in Iraq and Syria, as I did on this trip, many of whom have also fled to Europe because they feel threatened by the jihadi onslaught and they don't see what their future will be. But the Kurds, again, uh, this is a new generation, young Kurds, educated. They want to learn the language. This is material that could help not hurt Europe. But the population, few of them know this. It's very hard to distinguish. And in fact, the, the group of refugees who threatened and mistreated women in Cologne, which became a, a very famous incident. This was not Syrian refugees. And few will be aware, as I said, that the fleeing Syrians are largely middle class and more prepared for integration than the Turks were, or than the young Afghans who were desperately now fleeing by the thousands to Europe. The times that we live in are terribly complicated. It takes skilled politicians to calm these really understandable fears, to find the funds to school and train and integrate new immigrants. And by the way, uh, to figure out a way to train local imams who speak the local languages. I think one of the risks of the new immigration is that the Saudis will send money in to train imams in Wahhabi thinking because so many of the new immigrants are Arab speakers. That is not what is needed. The Germans are beginning to train local imams who are German speakers. <laughs> means the German security can listen to them in the mosque, but it also means that they're not under Saudi influence. And this is something, along with the kind of schooling these children will need, that responsible politicians could be promoting. Responsible politicians could also find a workable formula to check the flow until the current wave is settled. That is unavoidable. And until the slim prospects for peace in Syria can be more fully explored. It takes gutsy politicians to explain to frightened publics that yes, Islam is rent within by a vicious struggle between a radical, aggressive trend and the rest. And unfortunately, the rest have no pope. So there is no one voice that can speak for Sunni Islam. And Arab leaders are weak. This is a reality. But at least somebody has to be able to put it to nervous publics and to tell them that even if we pursue smarter anti-terrorist policies than we have, the problem is likely to continue for some time. And if anyone wants to ask me questions about that, because one of the things that I went to Syria and Iraq to look at is when and if there is going to be an offensive to take back Raqqa and Mosul, Iraq, the major cities of the so-called caliphate. And I learned a lot on that trip, but I won't go into it in these remarks. Now, President Obama has tried fitfully to put forward some of this explanatory uh, information, but for many reasons, he has been ineffective. And it's so much easier to take the opposite tack, to call for a holy war against Islam. I wrote a column today in the course of which I learned some things about Senator Cruz that I hadn't been familiar with before, including the fact that he has on his staff a general named, retired, named Jerry Boykin, who was notorious when he was serving because he liked to preach to his troops uh, religious sermons, and he has called for holy war between Christians and Satan, meaning Muslims. This is the kind of approach that is so dangerous, but it is so much easier for a politician to make this pitch to whip up fearful voters in Europe against Muslims, uh, in the case of Donald Trump against Hispanics, and potentially we will see what happens in the case of Senator Ted Cruz. 
we are short of politicians with the charisma and stature to handle these complex issues well. Angela Merkel tried. I take my hat off to her, but she was probably too moral. She felt that because of Germany's history and because Europe had failed to come up with a helpful solution to end the Syrian civil war, that it was Germany's duty to take those refugees. I don't think she fully grasped what would happen once she said welcome, and now the immigration issue may bring her down. But at least I have to say, Angela Merkel was thinking about this and tried to explain it to her population. And unfortunately, our times are so jittery and skittery that a few episodes have turned the issue around. You remember initially, Germans were welcoming the immigrants at train stations, bringing food. There was really a very heartwarming reception, but the numbers were simply too quick and too much too fast. Um, <clears throat> this leads me to the role of the media in these terribly confused times. As you know, the media was critical in the Dreyfus affair, both in ways horrible and tremendously helpful. The anti-Semitic press, which meant most newspapers of the time, turned the public against Dreyfus. Um, you read about this affair, and I'm sure in the Beitler collection there is an enormous number of instances of screeds that outdo maybe not anything you would see these days, but most things that you would see even in small numbers. It is not politically correct these days um, to include such hideous uh, images of Jews, except in the Arab world. Um, in the Arab press, you will find them. But uh, in January 1898, uh, you had the other sign, side of the coin, Emile Zola's 4,500-word open letter to the then French president entitled Jacques. On the front page of the newspaper, Laura, which opened a whole new chapter in the affair and made it into a national cause. Laura had a circulation of 30,000 daily before it printed Jacques, and it sold 300,000 copies of that edition, which is really quite amazing. Dreyfus would not be fully exonerated until 1906, but the role of the media was critical. In Jacques, Zola wrote, it is a crime to poison the minds of the meek and the humble, to stoke the passions of reactionism and intolerance, by appealing to that odious anti-Semitism that unchecked will destroy the freedom-loving France of the rights of man. It is a crime to exploit patriotism in the service of hatred, and it is finally a crime to ensconce the sword as the modern god. It could be printed again. Um, in the age of the internet, with mainstream media struggling. No one writer or newspaper can bend the course of history the way Chuck Hughes did, especially because there's no one symbol that can summarize the issues at hand the way the case of Dreyfus did at that time. In a way, the photo of the dead child on the Greek beach, you all remember that photo, the three-year-old, briefly humanized the refugee issue and deeply affected Merkel. I think it was one of the reasons that she opened the door. But the memory of that photo has dimmed as the waves of refugees have mounted. And now, you know, even the signs of desperation, people have gotten used to it. 
uh, the dead bodies, overturned boats, people beating against fences that are now being put up, and desperately demonstrating in Greece not to be sent back to Turkey. The complexity of the refugee issue and the issue of terrorism defy definition by one picture or one article. And unfortunately, the media now is playing a negative role. Now, I always hate the use of the word media, so let me qualify. You know, I belong proudly to something known as the MM and often denigrated, that is the mainstream media. Um, you all look of an age like me um, to remember when certain newspapers defined public thinking when there were three television stations, when people had faith in Walter Cronkite. And so it was possible at that time to have stories that defined the issues, um, to put forward uh, news reports or commentary that had a stunning impact on the debate. The media is now horribly fragmented. And as you have seen in the case of the Trump candidacy, a fragmented media where success is now often defined by how many hits you get uh, is very susceptible to pursuing whatever and whoever it is that will give you the most hits. And thus, Donald Trump has gotten zillions of dollars worth of free publicity because people tune in, people read his tweets, people will look at stories about the outrageous things he has said. This is a huge problem. But despite the fragmentation of the media, I still believe that the role of the responsible media, and granted we are shrinking, but I still think that it is crucial in the struggle to retain tolerance at a time of global confusion. Now, when I came to this city, the Philadelphia Inquirer had a circulation of a half a million daily and a million on Sundays. I hate to tell you what the circulation is now. It's daily down around the two, it's over 200,000, I don't know how much over now, and over 300,000 on Sunday. Clearly that is a shadow of what it once was. But I still think that newspapers matter, whether or not you read them in the paper edition or, on, or online. The New York Times has become uh, almost the, uh, I mean, it always prided itself as the paper of record, but it is really the last of the once great American newspapers that maintains sizable foreign staffs. And never has it been more critical because in trying to explain what is going on with ISIS, you need a newspaper that has and was willing to spend the money to have multiple correspondents overseas. I can tell you this is a story that is impossible to cover if you simply have one correspondent in Beirut, and that is how you cover the Middle East. Even the once mighty Washington Post, now um, owned by Jeff Bezos, the tech guru um, has absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, given up even trying to do serious foreign coverage. They write a lot of their foreign coverage out of Washington. They have a wonderful woman who covers the Middle East out of Beirut, Liz Sly, but she can't be everywhere in one place. Uh, when I saw her at a conference, um, she had not been in the north of Syria um, Syrian Kurdistan for months. Now it happens that that's the one place where 50 US Special Forces and the Syrian Kurds and some Sunni tribals might actually be able to take back Raqqa. But there's no American correspondent and they're looking at it. And similarly, um, there is not enough American media looking at the issues I have described about how to prevent the tensions of our time from fueling extremism, which winds up elevating right-wing parties in Europe, breaking up NATO and breaking up the European Union. 
and creating a Europe that is totally different from what we have seen since World War II. As a member of the so-called responsible media, I admit that sometimes it seems as if serious journalists can't do much more than plugging fingers into a dike that is breaking under the pressure of junk journalism. Uh, but even if we are not in a position to emulate Zola, and even if the era is so different, I feel like there are things journalists can still do to confront the challenges he laid out in Jacuse. After all, what we're seeing in some ways is similar to the very language that he used as some of our politicians stoke the passions of reactionism and intolerance as we are watching in our own election. So our job as mainstream media, as far as I'm concerned, is to figure out how to counter that misrepresentation with opinions, in the case of columnists like myself, and facts. We can't be Emile Zola, but I think there is an enormous amount of material which, if it could only be gotten to the public, could help explain and situate people who are wondering where this country is going, where Europe is going, uh, what the economic challenges mean, what the challenges of terrorism mean, and simply can't get the information they need to feel as if they have a grasp on it. So to me, the lesson of the Dreyfus affair for today is that you need politicians and media who are willing to challenge intolerance and fight for tolerant societies. There is a shortage of both categories, um, but as a columnist, at least I get to try to do my very small little bit. Thank you for coming, and I'm open to questions. Would you like to handle the questions yourself? Sure. Or? Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Um, do you want to take a mic around, or do you yeah, think people? Got you got a mic? Got a mic? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I see a gentleman right here with a red. Sorry. Hi. Didn't ISIS arise from the uh, senseless invasion and slaughter of uh, over a million Muslims by our government? And did not the mainstream media support that? that uh, invasion based on what are obviously bold-faced lies? Um, well, first of all, uh, I challenge just about every statement <laughs> that you made. Um, uh, uh, no, no, let me answer you one by one. You ha no, um, believe me, I understand your angst. I have a book called Willful Blindness, the Bush Administration, and Iraq. The point that I challenge is the mainstream media, blah, blah. This is a very sore point for me because, frankly, uh, the excellent journalists um, of the Washington Post, uh, I will leave out the accolade and just say myself, uh, I have a book of columns I wrote just in the first two years of that war, Willful Blindness. Um, there was an enormous amount written by mainstream media about what was going on. That's number one. Uh, number two, there were not a million people killed. Uh, number three, uh, there were, believe me, this, the, the sadness of everything that happened and the subsequent deaths in the Iraq Civil War are horrendous. Exaggerated figures don't, wildly exaggerated figures don't help anyone. But thirdly, um, ISIS emerged from factors much more complicated than that. The impact of the Iraq war absolutely problems that are haunting the region, that are haunting us. 
Um, they led to the sectarian war, they did lead to the sectarian war fair that we see in the Middle East today. The sad thing is that um, this grew out of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda in Iraq grew out of the, the stupid failure uh, of the Bush administration to consider what would happen after the war. This much is true. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was wiped out in uh, seven, and the remnants went to Syria, where they were welcomed by Bashar al-Assad. And they stayed there and hibernated until the Syrian civil war started, uh, and until we left totally, carelessly, we got in carelessly, and we left carelessly in 2011. I believe there were things we could have done uh, that would have avoided uh, the resurgence of sectarian level that we see now in Iraq. But basically, ISIS grew in Syria courtesy of Bashar al-Assad and swept back because we left prematurely and allowed Iran basically to take full control and allowed an Iranian-backed prime minister to gut the army that we had retrained with political appointees, Shiite political appointees, who abandoned their posts. ISIS was small. It didn't need to take, I mean, there was no reason why ISIS should have been able to take Mosul. It was simply that the military leadership wasn't even in place. This is not to in any way totally dismiss what you said. Obviously, the Iraq war bears a lot of responsibility for things that happened afterwards. But the line is not. Um, I, I think that it is important to understand the role that the Syrian leadership had in this. They let out jihadis from prison. They cultivated Al Qaeda in Iraq. They allowed it to flourish. And because ISIS gives President Assad his raison d'etre, as long as he can point to ISIS, he can tell the world, you need me. So the most tragic thing about ISIS is that it didn't need to uh, uh, even emerge. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a dead issue, and uh, factors led to its coming back to life in the tragic way we see today. Um, thank you very much for those excellent remarks. My question is, could you say something about the roles of Iran and Saudi Arabia in any possibility of peace in our lifetimes in the Middle East? <laughs> Um, it's a very logical question because obviously if the Saudis and the Iranians can't come to some kind of agreement, I'm going to take one up here and then I'll go over there, um, can't come to some kind of accord on stopping their proxy war, um, this sectarian war is going to go on for a long time. Sadly, I think that is what is going to happen. Um, the Saudi government... Um, what did somebody call it? A religion with a state? Um, not a state with a religion. The Saudi government right now is led by a senile king um, with an aggressive and uh, I don't know how bright he is, but megalomaniacal son who, to whom he has given who has just about turned 30 and started this dumb war in, in uh, Yemen. And I just can't see the wisdom that is required. Uh, on the, uh, and as far as the Iranians are concerned, um, they're, you know, um, as per the previous questioner, you know, far be it from me not to dispense blame where blame is due. Um, and uh, first, George W. Bush empowered the Iranians by eliminating their main opponent, uh, opponents, the, the Taliban, 
uh, which I think was absolutely necessary, and, and uh, Saddam. And then both Bush and Obama basically let uh, Iran um, take control of the Iraqi government, so the Iranians are feeling their oats, believe that the deal we signed with Iran was better than the alternative, but I think it was badly negotiated, so that has helped the Iranians feel more oats, and I don't think they feel any pressure to rein in their support of the Shiite side. And so the two of them are just bound to clash. When you look back at how episodes of, of civil war and unrest stopped in the Middle East prior to this, the classic example was the Lebanese civil war, where outside parties were as they are fueling the Syrian civil war and unrest in Iraq. And the way that stopped was that in 1990, it had gone on so long that the the parties that were fueling it, which was then Saudi Arabia and the Syrians, decided to end it. The Syrians sent their army into Lebanon and the Saudis stopped sending money. They had a conference in Taif and the war stopped. Right now you have no deus ex machina that can impose. I mean, the U.S. has basically withdrawn and even, even if it had I think the U this is a long discussion, which I won't get into unless somebody asks me a direct question. I think there was more that the U.S. could do in Syria, and there still is, and I don't mean sending ground troops. But at this point, I don't see the Saudis and the Iranians stopping their proxy war, and we don't have the leverage, I don't think, to make them do it. So this is going to go on for a long time. Um, this gentleman here. You were talking about the fragmented media, and apparently what is happening is people read that media which fits their political views. So there's not any kind of, and you refer to Walter Cronkite, no kind of consensus media. Given that, how can you begin to spread a message of sense? No one is reading is reading enough to, to get the opposite views. I mean, is there a solution? Uh, I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, because obviously the polarized public is further polarized by the fact that it reads websites. Um, and, and it's amazing what is on some of these websites. Um, you know, the only two points I can make to respond to that are, firstly, I think that it's important for those people who still want an understanding of what is going on to be able to find it. Uh, you know, I guess it's people who can A, afford to subscribe to the New York Times, B, have the time to go online and read other sources. I mean, there's plenty of material there if you have a full-time job for it, uh, you know, material that is reliable, you actually can find out a lot more than you used to be able to of good material online. But, you know, who has the time to uh, search, aggregate? But for those people who want information brought by journalists, I think it's really important that media survive that can provide that. Beyond that, I think like all of us, I ask myself, what is it, who is it that can reach people who no longer have trust in government? And the sad thing is, I mean, you see who can reach them. Um, angry people on one side can be reached by Donald Trump. Angry people on the other side by Bernie Sanders. And actually, I think Bernie Sanders can cross over. Uh, you know, I'm not sure he can, but you know, I, I think Sanders can probably reach working class people that might vote for Trump. What is missing is someone with a, a more thought through program. Some, and maybe this is an impossibility in terms of who can 
speak to people in a charismatic but honest way. I think uh, probably many people here, uh, I certainly hoped in the beginning that Obama, President Obama was that person. Um, you know, we are all looking for an FDR, or at least, you know, that concept I have in mind. But of course, FDR was speaking to a radio audience that was glued on whenever it was, Saturday afternoons, to this talk. And he was the only voice out there. People didn't even know that he had crutches. Um, I don't know how you replicate that, but I do believe politicians can make a difference. I mean, Angela Merkel, in the beginning, simply because people trusted and respected her, Germans were willing to open their arms. It's simply that it went too far. Angela Merkel was, and I don't know if she has thrown it away, a politician who had earned the trust. Hardly strikes me as charismatic, but enough people believed her so that when she spoke, they listened, and she tried to be honest, or so it seemed to me. Um, I don't know who that person is. I wish it were Hillary Clinton. I mean, if it's Clinton versus Trump, she probably But clearly, she doesn't have that knack. She is wonderful speaking to small audiences. I have heard her. But she is too wonkish speaking to big. And the trust factor is missing, deservedly or undeservedly. I don't know where we find that politician. And as you the press is fragmented. So, you know, I mean, maybe I'm whistling Dixie. We know what the cure might, not cure, we know what the antidote to populism would be. But, um, you know, those in the media who can try to provide it are just in a little corner struggling. And the politician who could offer it so far is not to be seen. Question here and then question back there. Uh, the other uh, power player in the, in the Middle East is Turkey. And you didn't talk much about Turkey. So can you share what you think uh, Erdogan's agenda is? And then also talk about uh, um, their obsession with the, with the Kurds or why they feel threatened uh, by the Kurds? Because that's sure. interfering with... Um, <laughs> I've interviewed Erdogan twice, and both times I had a stroke. Um, Erdogan is a very ex excitable man. He gets extremely emotional, a vein throbs in his forehead, he turns red, and his staff hover around him as if they're expecting any moment to have to call the ambulance. But I think Erdogan's goal, I think Erdogan's goal has become one thing only, uh, to be able to amass the number of seats in parliament in order to change the constitution so that he can have uh, a powerful presidency rather than the symbolic presidency that Turkey now has. And he can control for God knows how long. And towards that end, I think he has, is doing things that are very dangerous for the country. Um, Erdogan very cleverly in his terms as prime minister had been negotiating with Turkish Kurds, which was very important to peace, stability, economic progress, and possible EU accession for Turkey. Um, and while he was negotiating with the imprisoned leader of the Turkish rebel group, the PKK, um, Mr. Ocalan, Erdogan was also talking with representatives of the Syrian Kurds. What has happened now is that for reasons of wanting to um, corral nationalist votes and expand his base, he has returned to all-out warfare with the Kurds. Now, the PKK is not blameless at all, but Erdogan simply has shot the bolt. He has gone back to cities in the southeast, massive civilian deaths. It's very hard to get news about it because nobody can get in to cover it. Moreover, he has totally cut off contact with the Kurds of Syria, um, and in fact, is blockading uh, the border with them, and has good relations with the Kurds of Iraq because they're totally dependent on him economically. If you look at the map, the Kurds of Iraq who have had a, a, a sort of a, a serious autonomy quasi-state ever since America established a no-fly zone in 1991, their oil pipeline goes through Turkey, all of their commerce, so they need 
need good relations, and they have them with Ankara. They're totally dependent on Ankara. So he has even, Erdogan has even prevailed on the Kurds of Iraq to often blockade the, the Syrian Kurds. The leadership of the Syrian Kurds is not allowed to get, the only way to get out is to go across the Tigris River in the other direction from the way I went in a little motorboat, and he's blocking it. I, I mean, the, the Iraqi Kurds are blocking it. Now, where this is so problematic for the United States is that the fight against ISIS is very heavily dependent on the Kurds. And especially in Syria, um, it would be far easier to take Raqqa, which is, it's a much smaller city, it's in, it's in uh, northeast uh, Syria, and it is the emotional, religiously historical center of the so-called caliphate. Mosul, the city that they hold in Iraq, the second largest city in Iraq, is much more important economically and far, far bigger. But it's much harder to take because the Kurds there are not going to go into the Arab heart of Mosul and different ethnic and religious players involved that it's very complicated to organize that. But in Syria, in Raqqa, the Syrian Kurds are capable. They can't just do it with Kurds because it's a Sunni Arab city. So they already have some Sunni tribal fighters and they are very anxious for the Americans to help organize a, a, a tribal force. We have 50 special forces in there. And if the tribal fighters in that part of Syria sensed that there was really the will on the US to go for Raqqa, I think, I mean, you know, they're beginning to shift ground. But we're not doing it because Turkey is totally opposed to the support we're giving to these Syrian Kurds and doesn't want us to give any more. And it's crazy because that is the direction to go. And if Raqqa fell, the beginning of the end for ISIS, because then Sunnis in Mosul would begin to think maybe it's time for the uprising, yada, yada. I mean, many things would follow after that. So in order to appease, placate, um, the Turkish ally, because we fly out of an air base in Turkey, in Shalik, uh, which is, makes it much easier for us to give air support to the, the Iraqis. And also, we, we are giving air support to the Syrian Kurds, but not for the major offensive that would really you know, take Raqqa. Uh, so what can I say about Erdogan, except he's doing his own country in by stoking a civil war. He's trying to head towards authoritarian government. He's arresting uh, opposition and journalists willy-nilly. And he's blackmailing the EU by charging them a fortune in order to take back refugees from Greece while getting them to say they'll speed up accession talks because he's helping them on the immigration policy. Um, good day's work but it's leading Turkey downhill, and it's really interfering with our ability to end the ISIS threat. Can I take uh, a couple more questions? Okay. All right. Um, this gentleman has hand up for oh, okay. All right, thank you. All right, we'll uh, take I'm not, one on I'm not sure side. whether I'm going to be the last question or not, but I, I want to just uh, uh, for a moment go back to um, the, uh, the, the Dreyfus affair. Um, and I, I understand the uh, uh, your analysis about the about the, uh, the, the parallel with the um, prejudice and intolerance to the Muslim. Uh, so there are two parts to this question. Uh, the first is that it, it, I never, uh, I don't believe if, uh, that the Jews were ever a terrorist group in Europe or anywhere else um, in modern history. So uh, I'm wondering, the first part of the question is whether in the European experience after uh, North Africa, Tunisia and Algeria, that the, um, the prejudice and the intolerance for the Muslim preceded the violence. I want a confirmation of that. And, and the other, and the second part of the question is uh, to what degree uh, is anti Semitism against the Jew uh, in Europe? Um, where does that fit in to the current uh, tolerance or intolerance right. in Europe? Right, good questions. Um, you know, as, as far as the first part, um, before the terrorist attacks, 
had, certainly in France, also in Belgium, was um, uh, an effort not really to deal with the assimilation problem. Each of them handled it in different ways. You did not have terrorism. You sometimes had violence. You remember oh, maybe five years ago, there was a, a real outbreak of violence, cars being burned and so forth by young people uh, in uh, the banlieue. Um, you know, frustration, and now you can say, you know, why don't they assimilate? Why didn't they learn the language? I mean, this is, well, in, in actual fact, it wasn't that the young people didn't know the language. Frustration, no jobs, it's a big issue, but assimilation was never really tried. Um, the, the guest workers in, in Germany uh, often settled in their own neighborhoods and brought wives who didn't speak the language, as I said. So language was a real problem there. In France, they were stuffed into these high-rises in these suburbs, and most of them, you know, sort of like the ghettos, the ghetto in North Philly, I mean, kids had never been into Paris and really had no future. So where things stood, and then came the terrorism. Of course, it is true. I mean, in the case of, of anti-Semitism in, in France at the time of Dreyfus, Jews, no, they were not terrorists. What you had was the claim that they were responsible for financial scandals. You always find, you know, a couple of financiers. There had been a big banking scandal in Paris at the time that the Dreyfus affair started, and two Jewish bankers were involved. So. Whoopee, you know, this provided the fodder. But um, I think the point that I'm making, you know, yes, there is a problem with Muslim jihadis, and they are preying on these unemployed youth. Some of them were from that cohort, and now they come back and get more of them. But there is also a large body of Muslims who don't belong to this, who are being tarred, and who nobody has figured out how to out to. As far as the issue of anti-Semitism, of course this is a big problem because the jihadis are going after Jewish targets. We saw it in France when they went after the Jewish grocery at the time um, uh, of, uh, I think it was Charlie Hebdo. Um, uh, and, you know, so the Jewish community is very unnerved by this, and there is an attempt, clearly, um, by these radical Islamists who have penetrated the communities to turn locals against the Jewish community, and yes, it is a problem. Again, I don't think it's universal, but I think probably that's a bigger problem for the Jewish community but anti-Semitism, you know, a specific problem for the Jewish community, but anti-Semitism or Jews as a political scapegoat used by the radical right have fallen out of fashion. I mean, you have Martine Le Pen kicking her father out of the party that he founded because she understands that you can't play that game in France. Maybe people quietly still think it, but you can't have anti-Semitic newspapers. And furthermore, Jews are in very powerful positions in the country, in politics. And so um, it, at the moment, um, the scapegoat of choice in the political sphere is not Jews. Um, uh, should I take one more or is that? All right, I will end it here then.